So good evening to people from India and good morning to people from other parts uh, of the world. And welcome to our webinar. On behalf of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society, I welcome one and all. We're first um, going to start off with a small uh, presentation about the society and the work that we do. Neha, please, could you share the video, please? Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Now I would like to, to ask Dr. B.S. Singhal, renowned neurologist and founder of Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society to please say a few words. Very good evening uh, to all in India and very good morning to our invited faculty. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all on behalf of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society. Nicole, this was a very, very powerful video that you presented and thank you very much indeed. 
as you know, Parkinson's disease is a chronic, very chronic, disabling disease. Person with Parkinson's disease suffers and also the caregiver suffers. Many symptoms which you are all aware of, but I think uh, if the voice gets very low, the communication suffers. People can't even understand what the person is saying. And similarly, if the bradykinesia and mobility get affected, then naturally the movements become very slow. And it is here, drugs help to a little extent, but I think we need a lot of physiotherapy and speech therapy. And we are very fortunate that the LSPT team from overseas, the global, has really spared their time to be with us to share their expertise with the physiotherapists from all over India. So Maria, yeah, I request you to introduce them and take it forward. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And thank you for your constant support in whatever we do. It really means a lot to us. Uh, it's such a pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Cynthia and Laura, our speaker for today's webinar. I've been meeting with Cynthia over the years at the World Parkinson's Congress, and we often discussed ways of collaborating and how we could work to bring LSVT to the allied health professionals in our country. At the PDMDS, we are constantly exploring and learning new approaches that we can adapt to our context and provide our support group members with multidisciplinary intervention strategies to improve the quality of their lives. Dr. Cynthia Fox is an expert on rehabilitation and neuroplasticity and the role of exercise in the improvement of function consequent to neural injury and disease. She is the world leader in LSVT Loud and conducted related efficacy research in Parkinson's disease and other disorders. She was the first to apply LSVT sound, LSVT Loud to disorders other than Parkinson's and pioneered the application to pediatric populations, including children with cerebral palsy. Dr. Fox worked on the development of LSVD Big. She is faculty for LSVD Loud and LSVD Big training and certification courses. Dr. Fox is CEO and co-founder of LSVD Global. Laura has extensive experience treating people with neurodegenerative disorders in various practice settings. She was LSVD BIC certified in 2009 and now serves as Chief Clinical Officer of LSVD BIG. Laura oversees the training curriculum and product development related to LSVD BIG and has helped to create many of the current LSVD BIG treatment tools, webinars, and courses. She has spoken at many national and international conferences on topics related to LSVD BIG. We're really looking forward to hearing from both of you and learning through this webinar. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barreto. And I think without further ado, I'm going to ask um, Cynthia to please take the stage. Excellent, thank you very much. And, and we are thrilled to be here this morning for us, this evening for you. Let me get my screen shared. And can you see the full slide? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect, excellent. So thank you so much for the beautiful welcome and for everyone attending uh, all across India this evening. Laura and I, as I said, are really thrilled to be here and we're excited to finally have this come to fruition um, to be able to begin hopefully, which will be a long partnership um, with your association and bringing LSVT Loud and LSVT Big to people with Parkinson's disease in India. So today, Laura and I are going to introduce you to LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, which are evidence-based uh, occupational, physical, and speech therapy programs that were developed for, specifically for people with Parkinson's disease. So we had a very nice introduction already, a little bit about who we are. Again, I'm Cynthia, and I'm here with my colleague, Laura. And um, Laura, I don't know if you wanna unmute and say, say hello real quick.
Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now I think oh, you can you hear are. me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Um, welcome, everyone. I just want to echo what Cynthia said in that we're really very honored to be able to have the opportunity to share some information with you about the LSVT programs. And we hope that this will be the first of many conversations and opportunities to interact with you in the future as well. Excellent. And you'll hear much more from Laura in the second half of the presentation today. Um, you've already learned a little bit about us in our introduction. I'd like to acknowledge the research support that we've had over the past 30 years, really led by Dr. Lorraine Ramick, who has been the principal investigator on much of the research that was done on LSVT Loud. And without the support, we would not have the extensive research base that we have today, supporting not only that the treatments can be effective, but helping us understand why they work and also how can we make them potentially work better. We also disclose to you our relationship with the organization LSVT Global. We both have financial and non-financial relationships. Non-financial include a preference for LSVT Loud and LSVT Big as treatment techniques. In terms of financial relationships, I am um, an employee of LSVT Global and also a part owner of the company. And Laura is an employee of LSVT Global and we both receive lecture honorarium from the organization. We extend a huge thank you to the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Society of India, Dr. Maria Barreto, again, who we've spent years talking and now we finally get to, to hopefully start this relationship in a more um, forward manner to, to make it happen. And also to Nicole, who worked with us in helping us get set up and put this uh, presentation together for today. Our learning objectives in our time together are to describe the need for effective speech, physical, and occupational therapy interventions for people with Parkinson's disease. Then we're going to share with you the development and research data on these treatment programs and discuss both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big treatment concepts. Finally, we'll conclude by explaining how people with Parkinson's disease can find LSVT Loud and LSVT Big certified clinicians, and also a little bit about our training and certification program for speech, physical, and occupational therapists. So we'd like to, you now know a little bit about us. We, we'd like to know who's out there listening with us today. So if you'd like, you can type into the chat box there and let us know, are you a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, perhaps a nurse or physician or somebody else? And uh, Laura will take a look at that and, and chime in here a minute and kind of let us know who's out there in our audience today. Okay, looks like um, a huge mix of people coming in between many physiotherapists, um, speech language pathologists, not seeing too many occupational therapists yet. There's a few, good. Um, so really a nice mix, Cynthia. Keep, it, keep them coming, we love to hear it. Excellent, excellent, thank you. So as we know, Parkinson's disease really is a global concern. Up to 8 million people worldwide are living with Parkinson's, and that number is expected to double by 2040 as the population ages. Our mission is to really empower people with Parkinson's to restore and maintain their highest levels of communication, mobility, and independence in daily life through scientifically supported rehabilitation programs. And for us and our work, these include LSVT Loud, which is the speech therapy, LSVT Big, which is the physical and occupational therapy. And just a quick note, what does LSVT stand for in case this is completely new to you? It stands for Lee Silverman Voice Treatment. And actually it's named in honor of Mrs. Lee Silverman, who was a woman 
living with Parkinson's disease and was really the motivation for the work that Dr. Ramek did to initially develop this treatment protocol. So we have since shortened it more to the acronym of just LSVT, and we've expanded beyond just the speech treatment. So now we call LSVT loud, the speech therapy, and LSVT big is the physical and occupational therapy. LSVT Loud has become truly the global standard for speech treatment in people with Parkinson's disease. We have over 21,000 LSVT Loud certified clinicians in over 78 countries today. And in fact, my colleagues right this moment are training 101 uh, speech therapists in Germany. So we are virtual with a course in Germany um, right now, getting a new batch of therapists trained there. Um, we also have over 29,000 now LSVT big physical and occupational therapists certified in 55 countries. So it really is a global effort to reach out and do what we can to improve communication, mobility, quality of life for people with Parkinson's disease. So let's take a look at what happens with treatment and what does what do outcomes look like after LSVT loud and LSVT big. And we'll start with the woman who was 59 years old. She was two and a half years post-diagnosis at the time I treated her. She had noticed some changes in her voice and speech and was getting concerned about those. She is on her medications in the pre-video, on her medications in the post-video, and there were no changes in her medical treatment during the one month of intensive speech therapy or LSVT lab. Have you noticed any changes in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? Yes, I don't speak loud enough a lot of times. Mm. Anything else? Of course. Uh-huh. Anything else? I stutter, which I never did before. Mm. Do this for me if you would. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. Ah. Uh. Would you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Yes. Because? Because I stutter and then I can't be heard. If there's noise in the house, like when the kids come over, nobody pays attention to it because they can't hear me. Until I get mad and then yell. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. notice changes in your speech or your voice as a result of the speech therapy oh yes what have you noticed I talk louder I think louder <laughs> I'm going to sing with the son of the sons of pioneers one of these days with my my voice. <laughs> good for you that's excellent uh, what practicing do you do at home my ahs my highs and my lows and I read out the, the mail out loud Excellent. Do you feel like practicing helps? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, do you feel as though people can understand you all of the time now? Majority of the time, unless it's my husband, and he'll say, what? I can't hear you. Yeah. Good for you. But I think he does that just to be cute. I think he does, too. <laughs> Has anyone commented that it's easier to understand you now? Oh, yes. I set some of our friends back when we went to their house, and I talked loud. Lou says, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> My daughter said, oh, Ma, that's you? <laughs> Isn't that good? Don't you feel wonderful? Oh, yeah, because now she can't say, I didn't understand what you said. Right? No excuses, right? Yeah, that's no right. excuses. All right. So what do you do when you want to be as easy to understand as possible? Think loud. 
Excellent. So I think you can appreciate a lot of nice changes that happen after one month of intensive speech therapy. Obviously, her voice got louder, and that long ah is one of the exercises that we do. But what's important is we see more than just loudness change. Her voice is clearer. Her articulation is better. I think you can see her facial expressions have come alive. And we really get this um, increased confidence. And it's not that LSVT gave her this fun personality. It allowed her to express that personality that was living behind that softer voice and that masked face. So now let's take a look at a video of a person before and after LSVT Big. This gentleman was 71 years old and he was 14 years post-diagnosis. He was referred to physical therapy for slowness, difficulty walking, he was having falls and freezing. His Parkinson medications were optimized um, before starting LSVT Big, and no medication changes again during that one month of therapy. So what we'll see in this video, and there is no audio here, is an example of him walking out of the clinic after the first day of treatment, and you see that on the left-hand side of the screen, and then him walking out of the clinic after the last day of treatment, which you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, Pre-treatment, you see some pretty common gait challenges. He has short shuffled steps. He had a little bit of freezing hesitation at the doorway. He's using a cane, a bit of a stooped posture. After treatment, now his gait isn't perfect, but it's much better. He's walking with bigger steps, bigger stride length. He's got a little better arm swing, better posture, bigger posture. And obviously all that results in the fact that he's moving much faster than he was before treatment. In fact, in the video, he walked past his car, around the parking lot to show off uh, before he ever got to his car in the pre-treatment video. And these are very common types of changes that we see in gait. And when Laura speaks a little bit later, she'll talk about some of the other improvements that we see as well. So why uh, movements get bigger, just like in speech, other things improve as well. As we know, Parkinson's disease is a very complex disease. We have the motor symptoms, which for many years we focused on almost exclusively, the bradykinesia, which is slower movements, hypokinesia, smaller movements, rigidity, tremor, and certainly those are uh, characteristics that do impact speech and mobility and activities of daily living. But we also have to consider the very complex uh, constellation of non-motor symptoms. So individuals with Parkinson's disease oftentimes have higher rates of depression. There's subtle neuropsychological changes that can occur very early in Parkinson's that can impact learning and uh, thinking. Definitely, there are sensory proprioceptive changes, and these are very important in terms of what we do with LSVT Big and LSVT Loud, and both Laura and I will talk about that in more detail. There's emotional changes. Individuals can have increased anxiety, perhaps some apathy, and apathy isn't that they don't want to get better. It's just hard to get motivated and hard to get started. Higher rates of dementia, autonomic dysfunction and sleep disorders as well. Hypokinesia is the motor symptom that we really focus on when we think about what we do with LSVT loud and LSVT big because it affects speech and movement. In terms of progressive decrease in loudness of speech, we have hypophonia a progressive decrease in amplitude of handwriting, which results in micrographia, progressive shortening of stride length and arm swing during walking. And we certainly saw that in the video of the gentleman pre-treatment. A progressive decrease in speed and amplitude duration with repetitive movements of fingers and limbs. And we can see this in speech as well. So now we'll look at a video of a gentleman 
And I think he just, he tells a nice story really from his perspective. He has Parkinson's disease about how Parkinson's affects everything, but nevertheless, there is something that we can do about it. So this is our friend, Gary, and uh, he is living in Ireland. Do you remember at that time what that felt like when people were telling you this voice that felt normal is, is softer? Yeah, it, it felt, I must say it felt awful because um, it was kind of something I hadn't bargained for. I mean, I never, none of us ever bargained for Parkinson's in the first place, but um, I, I didn't realize that <laughs> what I know now is that Parkinson's affects everything in your life, everything. You know, make no mistake about it. Everything in your life is changed with Parkinson's. So if you kind of put that on the table, accept that and get on, you know, it's, it's a big thing to accept and a big thing to get over. But if you can get over that, you can start dealing with it and start, you know, saying, OK, hold on a minute. I'm not going to deteriorate into nothing in five years. I'm going to fight back. And that's what I was so, so grateful for with LSVT Loud. It gave me the tool. It has given me the tools I need to, to kind of keep my voice there and to keep my presence there. And um, it's really, guys, you know, you've transformed people's lives. There's no question about that. And uh, I'm, I'm so lucky and grateful that I've, I've been through this. And uh, my feeling now is that this becomes immediately on diagnosis uh, of Parkinson's disease. It should be in the remit of the multidisciplinary approach that everybody who is diagnosed should be, you know, uh, brought into on diagnosis. So Gary had both LSVT Loud, which he was speaking about there, and LSVT Big. But what he does is make such a nice point that nobody wants Parkinson's and it affects everything, but you don't have to stand by and just let it happen to you, that there are ways to fight back in a sense. And um, with exercise, with speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and that really is a mission in his statement that if you get engaged um, while you live with Parkinson's, you can live the best life you can. And that's what we're very passionate about uh, at LGBT Global. So let's talk about LSVT Loud and LSVT Big in terms of some parallel key concepts, and then we'll talk specifically about each of the treatment protocols. In therapy, our goal is to incorporate multiple principles that drive the concept of activity-dependent neuroplasticity. So we're affecting behavior that we see, but also underlying neural function. In order to do that, we know that our treatments need to be sufficiently intensive. So intensive practice is important for multiple plasticity. Complexity matters. And so as treatment progresses, we can add complex uh, movements, environmental enrichment, things that we know promote greater structural plasticity. Repetition matters. And so we have lots of repetitions of exercises and speaking and movements so that we really help people with Parkinson's learn a new way of functioning. Salience matters. Salience means something is meaningful and specific to the individual. And so we incorporate, even though we have standardized protocols of LSVT loud and LSVT big, they are very individualized to each person's functional goals. Timing matters. And we think in Parkinson's, the sooner the better, but it's never too late. And then specificity of training. And for Parkinson's and LSVT protocols, we're specifically targeting the hypokinesia. So these three key features then um, are the target is amplitude. So that results in loudness in speech and bigness in movement. The mode of delivery, intensive and high effort. And calibration is a term that we use that really addresses barriers to long-term maintenance and getting the treatment effects out into the real world. So we'll, we'll talk specifically about what that means for LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. And wrap that up, we have standardized research-based specific protocols that embrace these concepts.
So let's now delve into LSVT Loud more specifically in terms of the development, the data, and the treatment concepts. We know that speech disorders in Parkinson's disease are very common. Over 89% of individuals with Parkinson's disease worldwide suffer voice and speech disorders, and they can occur very early in Parkinson's disease. These are things such as reduced loudness, mono loudness, monotone voice, imprecise articulation. Does this matter? Absolutely. The consequences include being excluded from conversations, which really can result in a loss of dignity and for some individuals, a feeling of misery. Um, as I mentioned, the common speech characteristics are reduced loudness, hoarseness, breathy voice quality, monotone. So all the pitch inflection you hear in my voice now can become very flat and loss of that pitch inflection and imprecise articulation. And what's important to note, as I mentioned, these can occur very early, but even people who may be clinically asymptomatic for speech deficits report these feelings of embarrassment, social stigma, and social isolation due to speech concerns. Unfortunately, while our classic medical treatments are very important for the care and management of Parkinson's disease, they don't improve speech and voice. And so there's no evidence for systematic improvement in dysarthria or speech disorders. And in fact, the neurosurgical treatments sometimes actually don't improve speech and may actually contribute to some speech challenges after deep brain stimulation surgery. So we need something else. Now, historically, speech uh, disorders were unresponsive to speech treatment. And this is back in 1987 when Dr. Ramick began her work. There were no effective voice and speech treatments for Parkinson's disease. In fact, I'll read this quote from the literature. Voice treatment for disorders that are degenerative is controversial since there's no expectation for recovery of function or that any improvement secondary to speech language pathology intervention will be maintained in the long term. So it was not a good situation back then. Speech treatments didn't work. People weren't referred to therapy. If they were referred to therapy, it was sort of a, a dreaded referral. Oh no, I have somebody with Parkinson's because we just didn't know what to do to help individuals improve communication. Today, that is no longer the case. Um, speech language pathology in the world of Parkinson's can make a huge and powerful difference. And what we will be talking about and what our life's work really has been focused on, um, LSVT Loud. And so it's very Parkinson's specific. It was developed specifically for the disorders in Parkinson's disease. And it's very evidence-based today. It is also not just for middle or late stage referrals. We have a very powerful and active role in early stage as well, just beyond just establishing a baseline of what speech changes are there. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about that target. What we see pre-treatment in individuals with Parkinson's is this loss of motor energy. So movements are very underscaled. People have a soft voice. There's reduced drive. They're not taking a big enough breath. They're not opening their mouth wide enough. And what comes out is soft speech. With this one cue of amplitude, speak loud, we're really driving the brain to override that bradykinesia and hypokinesia. And with one cue of loud, we automatically get a bigger breath, vocal folds close more, mouth opens more, and out comes more clear articulated speech. Now, something important to note, we are not teaching people to talk too loud. We use the cue of loud just to get the right amount of effort for healthy, normal vocal loudness. Now, for the person with Parkinson's disease, it may feel too loud, and we'll talk about that perception in just a moment. 
So the target of amplitude, the second key concept again, comes back to mode of delivery being intensive and high effort. So the minimum dosage for efficacy based upon our 30 years of research has been the 16 sessions, four consecutive days a week for four consecutive weeks, 60 minute individual treatment sessions. Um, and then we also have daily homework exercises, daily carryover assignments that we provide all 30 days of the month. And this treatment is delivered by LSVT certified clinicians. While people are with us though, our goal is to really make a lifelong habit of practice and that intensity really is required to create those new habits in our brain. This is a snapshot of what a treatment session looks like. On the left-hand side is the first half of the treatment session. We have three daily exercises, those long ahs, which we do a minimum 15 repetition, high, low ahs, and functional phrases. We then take that voice that we've scaled up in the first half, and in the second half of the session, we systematically train that into functional speech. I'm, I'm not gonna say too much more about that now because I'm gonna show you a video. Uh, in this first video, you'll see Angela working with an individual with Parkinson's disease, Bob, and just one clip of each of the daily exercises. So the long ah, the high low ah, and functional phrases. So what I want you to do first is you're going to be thinking loud and you're going to do what I do. Uh, and I want you to do that and hold it out. So when you're ready, go ahead. Uh, Keep it going. Keep it loud. Good. Keep going. Keep going. Keep it loud. Okay. Great. Excellent. Super. Do one more just like that. Uh, Excellent. Perfect. That's the voice I want to hear. And let's do... Uh, 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 beautiful. That's it. Do it again, just like that. Let's start again with number one. I want you to think loud. Start at the top. Good morning. Perfect. Keep that going. I'll go out and get the paper. What's on your schedule today? Try it. What's on your schedule today? What's on your schedule today? Good. Keep that up. I'll get the phone. Perfect. Do you need anything while I'm out? Okay. I'll give you a call and see you later. All right. Uh, we'll go down and get the mail. Okay, so that's just a little snapshot of what those three exercises look like. Again, that takes the first 30 minutes of the treatment session. The entire second half of the session is taking that voice we rescale up in the first half and train it into functional speech. And as the weeks of therapy progress, the speech we practice gets longer in length of utterance as well as more complex. So we'll start with words and phrases, which you'll see in this video. We move to sentences, to paragraph reading, to conversational speech. So we're gradually building somebody's ability to keep a louder voice for longer periods of time. In this video example, they're in week one, so the phrases are pretty short. Do that one again, nice and loud for me. DeLorean DMC-12. Okay, excellent. 1932 Ford Roadster. Perfect. 1955 Chevy Bel Air. Good. Ford GT40. Mm-hmm. Tesla. 1937 Packard. Good. Now, you just said some of these you don't like in your loud voice. Tell me one of the cars you don't like on this list. I don't like the Lamborghini Contact. Okay, good loudness when you told me that. Excellent. So we're going to keep going, keeping up that loudness. Mercedes-Benz 300 SI. Okay. Jaguar XK120. Toyota Prius. Mini Cooper. Oh, 
Keep up that loudness. Minnie Cooper. Minnie Cooper. There you go. El Camino. Mm hmm. Stout Scarab. That's an interesting name. Pierce Silver Arrow. Good. 1969 Chevelle. Okay. Mazda Miata. Audi TT. Bentley Continental. Ferrari 288. Minivan. Okay, so keep up thinking loud each word. Mercedes McLaren SLR. Okay. Okay, so this is an example of hierarchy. Now, when I talked about salience, this gentleman loved classic cars. So Angela found list of cars and we use that as his speech exercise. So when we talk about personalizing our treatment materials, this is a great example. The other thing that she did, he was reading along, but every once in a while she would ask him a question. What she's listening for is, does his loudness drop or can he keep his loudness up there? So there's lots of subtleties going on uh, in that nice video example. So we have our treatment exercises on the left, the long Oz, the high low Oz, but that is not the goal of therapy. That's a tool. The goal of therapy is that good loud voice transfers into conversational speech. Now let's talk a little bit about, about calibration. So those are the motor exercises, but we know that the soft voice in people with Parkinson's may be perpetuated by abnormal sensory feedback. Many people with Parkinson's have reduced awareness of their vocal loudness deficits pre-treatment. As a result, they don't self-correct. When people don't hear them, they don't automatically go, oh, I was too soft, I need to be louder. And oftentimes they feel as though their voice is loud enough, even when they are too soft. So this next video will show a couple clips of individuals with Parkinson disease expressing, even though you can hear their voice is not normal, that it feels okay to them. Now, to me, I sound, my voice sounds normal to me. I think I'm at a normal voice level, but then again, I think that when other people say no, it's not loud enough. Okay, so other people are saying your voice yeah. isn't loud. What were your first speech and voice symptoms? What were the first things you noted, if anything, that were different with your voice and speech? I never really noticed anything different about it. Okay. I've always had kind of a monotone voice, I guess you might say, where people, it's not very loud. What would you say is your most significant problem with voice, speech, or communication today? I don't know if I have any. Okay. What would you say is your most significant problem with your voice or speech or communication? I think I'm speaking loud enough and Obviously, I'm not because I'm asked to repeat or to speak up. It sounds loud enough to me. You should be able to hear me normally right now, I think. What were you okay, so multiple times, people, their voice is soft, uh, maybe hoarse, maybe breathy, and they're, they're saying, I, I think I'm fine. It, it sounds normal to me. Um, and, and that's the real challenge of successfully treating speech in people with Parkinson's disease. They come into our treatment room, we can get them loud from a motor perspective, but if we don't retrain their perception of what normal loudness sounds and feels like to them, when they walk out the door, they'll go right back to that soft voice. So they feel too loud when we perceive their voice to be normal. They can respond very positively to that external cue to speak loud, but it's difficult for them to internally cue or self-correct. And they do not spontaneously maintain or adapt treatment techniques without an intensive treatment focus with a sensory focus. So we have to address this mismatch in what they think sounds normal and what we perceive as normal. And that is the most challenging part of successful speech treatment for people with Parkinson's disease. 
retraining that internal calibration of what normal loudness feels and sounds like. It's also, also the most fun part of treatment from the perspective of a therapist because it's a challenge and each person is different when they kind of have that aha moment about how how that voice when it feels too loud to them is so impactful. And in our training and certification courses, we spend a lot of time talking about how to recalibrate the voices of people with Parkinson's disease. Okay, now on my last bit before I turn it over to Laura to talk about LSVT Big, let's talk a little bit about the research. So this again has been a 30 year journey from the initial um, invention of LSVT Loud to the scale up. This work again began back in the late 1980s, led by Dr. Lori Ramig um, at the Lee Silverman Center for Parkinson's Disease in Scottsdale, Arizona. And it was she was brought in to develop a speech treatment protocol. And that was the beginnings of what is today known as Lee Silverman Voice Treatment or LSVT Loud, LSVT Big. That clinical data was then used to write a series of NIH, National Institutes of Health funded research grants, um, three randomized controlled trials. And in about 2000 is when we began the translation and development of LSVT Big. In more recent years, we have spent a lot of time working on what we call clinical implementation. This is taking the research that we've developed, we've published, and translating it into clinical practice. And one of our real passions is that the quality of the treatment that patients receive is consistent with what we did in our research studies. And that's why we have training and certification and renewal and education so that we can keep everybody delivering the best possible therapies. These are graphs representing our three randomized controlled trials for LSVT Lab. And I'll just walk you through these because it's a fascinating story of how we got to where we are today. First of all, when we talk about a randomized controlled trial, these studies designs um, are just that, they're very controlled. So the treatments we delivered are matched for dosage, they're matched for intensity, they're matched for homework, and they're matched for clinician enthusiasm. You know, when we're working with our patients, we have the same amount of excitement. What's different? is one element of the treatment so we can begin to piece apart what works and what does not. The data that are analyzed are done by people who don't know what treatment or not treatment a person got. The people who are collecting data pre and post and follow up did not deliver the treatment. And when we collect data, there are no cues given to individuals to use a treatment target. So it's uncued tasks. Now, the first randomized controlled trial, we wanted to look at the best way to improve loudness in people with Parkinson's disease. So the two treatments were one focused on respiratory and voice. So think loud. The other was a respiratory only treatment. And the we know to improve loudness in a typical system, you can do that either through increasing respiratory support or vocal loudness. So we did not know if one was better than the other for people with Parkinson's. The respiratory treatment, the cues were oftentimes things like breathe, use your air, use your breath. Um, in the voice treatment, it was think loud. For example, the long ah, uh, which engages the voice was part of loud. In contrast, the respiratory treatment did long. So we took the voice out of it, but really put the drive in the respiratory system. What you see in this top graph, I know it's a little bit small, is looking at pre, immediately post, <clears throat> And in this first group, we actually followed individuals out to two years post-treatment. What we saw, blue is LSVT or the voice treatment, the orange is the respiratory treatment. Both groups got better immediately post-treatment, but LSVT allowed to a greater extent. And when we followed people out to two full years after treatment, 
only the group that received LSVT loud was still statistically significantly louder than pretreatment and better than the alternative respiratory treatment. So at the end of that trial, it was the first time we've ever shown that speech treatment can work and last in people with Parkinson disease. And we recognize that treating voice was essential, that we have to add the vocal fold adduction. Respiratory treatment alone was not sufficient. We moved to the second randomized controlled trial, and here we wanted to look at control groups. So the first trial had two active treatments. In the next trial, because the voice treatment worked better, we took the voice treatment, again, known today as LSVT loud, compared that to a group that received no treatment, as well as to a group that we followed over time of just uh, healthy aging. And what we found was we replicated that LSVT loud got louder, lasted out to six months and as expected, but we wanted to study that the untreated group did not uh, change over time. The third randomized controlled trial. So now we've, we've looked at LSVT compared to an alternative respiratory treatment to no treatment groups. What we were finding in those early studies is what you saw in the video. Other things were changing. Um, articulation, facial expression, a lot of things that have to do with the face and the oral mechanism. So in the next study, we were curious, you know, is voice special or what if we put all of the effort into the articulatory system, the oral motor system? So in this study, the focus was on enunciate as our comparative treatment. And we called it LSVT RTIC. So again, they were matched for everything, but loud, the cue was still loudness. But for RTIC, it was all about enunciate and putting that effort into the articulatory system. And we also had untreated control groups. Again, we followed them pre, post, out to six months. And what we found was not only for the target of loudness, but also for the target of speech intelligibility, focusing on voice was more powerful than focusing on articulation. So at the end of the day, through this type of systematic research and randomized controlled trials, we began to piece together the story that it appears voice is very important and that amplitude for improving communication in people with Parkinson disease. Now, beyond efficacy, we've had numerous studies, again, looking at things like facial expression, speech intelligibility, voice quality, respiratory support, swallowing, and even neuroimaging. And that's been powerful, again, to help us understand the mechanism of treatment-related change. And I, I, we don't have time to go through all those data, but what I would like to just highlight because it's very exciting and I think um, unique in, in speech treatment literature for Parkinson's is what we saw with some of the neuroimaging studies. So we have two published PET studies. We actually have a third one in the queue that we're working on getting published right now. The first, and these were just pre-post LSVT lab. So in that first study with 10 subjects, we had five individuals with Parkinson's disease, five controls, and it was just a phonation task, which was just uh, something like the long ahs. Then we had 10 subjects in the second study with Parkinson's, and they were doing more of a speech task, a reading task. We had one fMRI imaging study, again, pre, post, LSVT lab, with 22 subjects, and this was done by a group, Baumann and colleagues in Germany, 11 with Parkinson's, 11 control, and they did covert reading in normal loudness and high intensity or, or louder speech. So these studies involve three different cohorts of subjects with Parkinson's disease, two independent imaging laboratories. And while I'm, 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 I'm giving you a very high level of the outcome, but across these three studies, a common finding was this right-sided shift of activation to areas in the brain involved in prosodic, which is pitch and loudness, monitoring of speech.
So again, this right-sided increased activation in the brain post-treatment in areas of the brain that we know are used for monitoring pitch and loudness. And so this has been hypothesized to be a neurocorrelate of this concept of sensory recalibration. So in treatment, we're actively teaching patients a new way to monitor the right amount of loudness and effort they need. And what we're seeing in the brain is a neural correlate perhaps of that activity. So very exciting. We have a lot more to learn, um, but that's just one example beyond the efficacy of what we try to study and learn with LSVT Loud. Um, and just in closing, in, in my section here with LSVT Loud, it, we've studied beyond Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease is where we own our randomized trials, our huge data sets. But when we look beyond Parkinson's disease, we have a number of case series, single subject, small group designs. And what we found was there are very solid neural treatment principles in this protocol consistent with principles that drive activity-dependent neuroplasticity. And for select individuals who have dysarthria secondary to stroke, to multiple sclerosis, ataxia, even healthy aging, the, the treatment has been helpful. And work that I've done and, and we're very excited about and we're, we're digging in to get this out into the clinical practice more is actually it's worked for pediatric populations, children with cerebral palsy and children with Down syndrome. So if you're a therapist and you're thinking, well, this might be interesting for Parkinson's, but I don't see that many clients with Parkinson's disease, um, allow this to open your mind that this is really a solid, therapeutic approach and protocol that may have application to a wider range of different clients that you may have on your caseload. Okay, so now I'm going to stop my screen share and turn the microphone over to Laura, who will walk you through what we know about LSVT Big. Hi, everyone. Let me just uh, get my screen shared here. All right, just one moment, please. Okay, and I'm assuming everything looks good, unless I hear otherwise from you. Look okay, Cynthia? It does, it looks perfect. Okay, okay, great. And thank you for that great overview of LSVT Loud. And now we're gonna really dig into LSVT Big, which is the physio and occupational therapy treatment protocol for people with Parkinson's and other neural disorders. And this will be very much parallel with what Cynthia just presented on LSVT Loud. So we'll take a look at the development data and treatment concepts. Um, on a very high level overview for LSVT big. So as you know, Parkinson's is very complex and Cynthia did a nice job of going through those symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But now if we think about really how do they impact function and activities of daily living and mobility in Parkinson's disease, many different ways. Um, and I think, you know, historically we were always very good about treating the motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And it hasn't been until recently that us as physiotherapists and occupational therapists are thinking more about how the non-motor symptoms of PD impact function. So we know that dual tasking is a challenge, even in the early stages of Parkinson's disease. And um, everything that we do, whether we're doing things at work, we're out shopping in the community, we're interacting with um, family members at home, we're always walking and talking, doing two things at once, thinking about something while we're doing a task. It's just how we function as humans. But this becomes really difficult in Parkinson's disease. And it um, affects their efficiency. They have to slow down if they have to concentrate more on their movement so that they're not going to trip or fall, for example, uh, makes everything harder. 
We know that postural instability is one of the primary symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and this tends to get worse as Parkinson's disease progresses. And so certainly safety is impacted when a person is moving and functioning, not only in their home, but in the community as well. And because of this, many people have fear of falling. And even before they've ever had a fall, there's a great number of people that have fear of falling. Um, the rate of falling is much higher in people with Parkinson's compared to community dwelling elders. And if you're fearful of falling, you're more likely to you know, withhold from participating in activities that you might feel at risk for doing, even if those are things that you enjoy doing. Movements become smaller and slower, um, both gross motor movements like walking, getting out of a chair, getting out of bed, but also fine motor tasks like buttoning buttons or using um, a pen or a pencil to do handwriting. So everything takes longer. We have people with Parkinson's, that disease that say, I have to get up so much earlier in the morning to get ready because it just takes me longer. There's difficulties with initiation as well. You and I, of course, when we wanna go somewhere, we just um, jump out of the chair and, and go and do what we wanna do. But for a person with Parkinson's, it can take them much longer to initiate movement, to initiate activity. And many people have tremors and we know that that can affect a person's ability to uh, manipulate objects such as their pen or their utensils as they're eating. And one of the primary non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease is apathy, just that lack of motivation, that lack of interest in things that they once used to enjoy, things that are important to them. Um, and so this can affect a person's motivation to even seek help, to seek therapy, to participate in exercise, either on their own or in the community. So those are the hurdles that we really need to think about. How are we going to address those as physio and occupational therapists. So just as with LSVT Loud, our singular focus for LSVT Big is amplitude. And the wonderful thing is that when we focus on amplitude, there's many things that change. What you saw with Shirley was um, a cross system effect of her, her facial expression improving and her articulation and so many things. You also saw that with the, the pre-post LSVT big video that not only did his amplitude improve, but also his, his posture, his speed, his balance, et cetera. So when patients come in to see us for therapy and they have Parkinson's, their movements are too small, their posture is affected, they walk with a very narrow base of support, they're often unsteady. And our goal is always to achieve a healthy movement amplitude. The way that we do that is to drive their effort. And through that, you'll start to see those nice cross system effects. And so it's, it's really great as a therapist to see that even though you're focusing on amplitude, hey, I'm also getting changes in balance and posture, coordination, et cetera. The mode of LSVT big is intensive and high effort. And so the minimum dosage is parallel with what you learned about for LSVT loud. It's four consecutive days a week for four weeks. These are one hour sessions. These are individualized therapy sessions. They're not group therapy sessions. And after I explain a little bit more about the protocol, you'll realize the, the rationale for that. The patients also have daily homework exercise and what are called carryover assignments all 30 days of the month. And so it's always delivered by therapists who are certified in LSVT big. It could be physiotherapists, it could be occupational therapists. Um, the, obviously LSVT loud is for speech therapy. Um, the other thing that you might want to know is that LSVT big can be delivered in a combined or shared approach by physio and occupational therapy where one therapist is seeing the patient for two days a week and the other therapist is seeing the patient for the other two days a week. And that's really great for the patient so that they have their needs addressed more comprehensively um, through the framework of the LSVT protocol. Overall, uh, one of the goals of this intensive practice is to get patients in the habit of exercising consistently lifelong. 
you know that many of our patients with PD are um, sedentary or they're not used to exercising. And when we give them this intensive dosage, it really does get them in the habit. And then we have tools to help them maintain that after discharge from therapy. This is a snapshot of an LSVT big treatment session. You can see that there are a series of exercises called maximal daily exercises. These are large amplitude movements in all planes. We have some big walking that every patient does. Um, obviously that varies from patient to patient. Some of our patients are very mobile and you might be working on really high level challenges where as some people, their walking might be as simple as going um, from one room to the next or from transferring from the wheelchair to the bed or even working on wheelchair mobility. So that does vary greatly, but we're working on the amplitude of that task. And then on the right side, you see something called functional component tasks and hierarchy tasks. And this is where we more specifically drill down what are the functional things that are important to that patient um, that they're having difficulty with because of their Parkinson's disease. And so it could be a variety of things. No two patients are the same, but we're really trying to identify what are the things that they want to improve. That way it becomes very, very motivating for them as well. Then the patient has homework and carryover so they can practice this at home and work on generalization to movement outside of therapy. So I won't go through all of the exercises. Uh, you can learn all about that if you decide to become LSVT big certified, but you can see that there's a variety of positions and movements. Um, a couple of them, you see the model here, sitting down and doing more sustained movements, the rest are in standing. However, I do wanna let you know that these can be adapted for a variety of individuals. Um, they can be adapted to a seated position or even a supine position. And sometimes people just need a little upper extremity support of hanging onto a chair or a wall or something like that. So um, we can adapt them as needed. In this next video, I'll show you just a clip of a few exercises of our one of our instructors, Jenny, doing one of the exercises. And then it'll just give you a taste of what it looks like to train these exercises with a person that has Parkinson's. Our next exercise is the step backwards and reach. You want to be sure to start with your big posture and you're going to have big hands and then we're going to do a nice big step back, big arm movements and then come back and finish big. Now let's swing those arms, big posture, get up there. Big arm swings. There you go. Nice job, Bob. Reach, 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 reach. One more and big finish. Ready? Big twist. Good, good, good. You can have this one way oh, out here. Over. This one out here. Nice and big finish. One more, just like that. Big twist. There you go. Nice job, Bob. And back. You got better with each one. All right. So that's just a little flavor of what it looks like. I think you could hear how many times that she said the word big. And so truly, the focus of the therapist is always on amplitude. Is my patient stepping big enough? Or do they have big hands? Are they using big posture? And you're always thinking about how can I drive that amplitude to override the hypokinesia and bradykinesia that this patient is experiencing? Our next. So although amplitude is one of the primary things that we focus on and one of the primary things that improves, there's a range of secondary effects that you will see on a routine basis with your patients. Um, and there's other benefits of the LSVT big exercises as well. Um, you, your patients will have improved ability to start and stop movement. And we know that for many people, that's difficult. They have festination and freezing of gait. And so this really helps with both that go signal and the no-go signal. The exercises are done in multiple directions. So it helps them to learn how to efficiently and safely change directions, turning, backing up, stepping forward, et cetera. 
we build repetitions over time. So it really builds their endurance and we're working on them at a high level aerobically as well. And that helps to improve their aerobic threshold. Balance improves, um, strength improves, range of motion flexibility improve, posture improve. Those are all some really nice secondary benefits that you'll see through the LSVT protocol. So although the exercises are a key part of what makes LSVT big successful, one of the differentiators of the program is it doesn't just stop at exercise as many physiotherapy programs do. This also incorporates really specific functional task training for the patient. So the second half of the session is all about that. And this is kind of a really good example here where the therapist might be working with a patient in the first half of the session on the forward rocking and reaching exercises, working on really big reaches. And during that exercise, she might say, okay, do you feel that effort as you're reaching? That's the same effort you need to use when you're at home trying to get a book off the top shelf or reaching for something in your kitchen that's up high. And so the patient is beginning to understand there's a link and there's a purpose between the exercises and function. And then we might go ahead and practice actually reaching things from high shelves during the therapy session. So LSVT Big always includes personalized, purposeful practice. Again, this is individual and these pictures depict some examples. It might be related to dressing such as buttoning or getting the socks on or getting the pants on. It might be mobility activities like getting in and out of bed or up from low chairs or in and out of the car. It might be activities of daily living like brushing teeth, putting on makeup, doing their hair. Um, really what you'll do as a therapist is identify what are the most important things for that patient to work on and then really use amplitude as a way of rescaling their movement efforts so they can do that more efficiently and more independently. In this next video, you'll see Jenny working with our friend Bob who has Parkinson's on the task of buttoning. Um, he said that that was difficult for him. So in the first part of the video, you'll see him just doing this in his usual way. His fingers to him feel very stiff, it's very difficult for him. And then she's going to use amplitude as a way of driving his effort so he can do that buttoning more e efficiently. And she does that a couple of different ways. So take a look. Good, and I want you to just kind of uh, notice as you're watching Bob do his buttons, kind of the, it's a very slow, small, small kind of movement that he's using to try and get those buttons through the buttonhole. Yes, we do struggle. <laughs> and this can be a very frustrating thing for a lot of people, Bob. You're not alone in that. Does the top button tend to be one of the hardest ones for you? Yes. Okay, okay. Good, you got it though. All right. Do that. So let's, let's do, do that. it. Ready? Four, one, two, two three. three. Go again. Wow. Really push it in hard. Nice. That's about a third of the time. You're right, you're right. Good job. Now go back in and close it like you're angry with it. Really push it in strong. Yeah. Nice. How fast is that? Even quicker. Uh, even quicker. You're right. I haven't good. done a button that quick and I don't know how long. <laughs> good, good. All right. So I love that video because it shows um, this deficit of amplitude. A lot of times your patients might say to, the, to you that, oh, my fingers feel so weak or they feel stiff and, you know, maybe I have my spouse help me with a button. Sometimes as therapists, we give them a button hook. But really what we can see is that he is capable of doing that buttoning much more efficiently, much more independently by just driving his effort, driving his motor output or his amplitude. And as a therapist, it's wonderful to give that patient the gift of independence and empowerment over being able to do that on his own.
And through lots of repetition of practice, hopefully this would become his new way of achieving his buttoning task. So one of the ways that we do this through LSVT Big is something called calibration training. Um, there is a sensory deficit that is pervasive in Parkinson's disease. Classically, people with Parkinson's, even early in the disease, don't understand just how small and, sm and slow their movement has become until they maybe see themselves on video camera or catch a glimpse of themselves in a window or a mirror and recognize that their arm isn't swinging. So as a therapist, when we get them moving bigger, it can feel really weird to them. It can feel abnormal. And your patient might say to you something like, I can't walk like this. People will think I'm crazy, even though you as a therapist says, wow, that looks fantastic. It looks beautiful. So the calibration training is a way that we address that mismatch between their perception of their movement and how others perceive it. And it takes all of 16 sessions to really reset or recalibrate them so that they understand, yes, this is how it needs to feel in order to stand big, in order to move with normal gait, in, in order to do all my activities of daily living, whatever it is, and becomes this constant thought that's ingrained in their brain. In the next video, you'll see a friend of mine with PD, his name is Leon, and he's just explaining how he really utilizes this single cue of think big to help him in everything that he does throughout life. The fact about the bigness is uh, I've learned that like, like when I put my pants on in the morning here and I put my feet in the jeans, I'm kind of a little bit groggy, you might say, and I start Pull and it's, I start and struggle, and, and then all, all the ones that clicks on me, it says, think big, you know, and then wham, you know, it, it changes, literally changes. You know, it's like they, they showed, put your jacket on, you know, don't, don't sneak it in there, you go, wham, you know. So, so the, the thing about the exercise is not just a particular exercise, it's the mentality of accomplishing things with big movements because with the Parkinson's, it retards you in, in a sense. So you have to mentally shift to big, you know, and you really do. And I find, man, things work a lot better. There's things I'm doing now that my daughter says you shouldn't do it and I go do it, you know, because I think big, you know, I carry things, you know, that are a little heavier than what I would in the past. So it's really, it's, it's just that bigness, you know, and so I didn't quite understand it then, but it, 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 I learned, you know, what it meant as I went on. All right, so I love what he said, and really that's our goal. There's no way that we can train every possible task or situation that a patient might encounter in everyday life in 16 hours of therapy. But when they learn this generalized cue of think big and discover that, hey, it works for everything I do, whether it's getting out of my vehicle or you know, going shopping and reaching for things off of the shelves, this think big helps me to do it better and more efficiently. So let's take a look at some of the research on LSVT big. And again, this is gonna be a very high level overview and I'll show you on our website where you can find all of the references on both treatment protocols at the end of this section. So one of the foundational research studies that was done on LSVT big was first published in 2005 called Training Bigger to Move Faster, the application of speed amplitude relation as a rehabilitation strategy for people with Parkinson's disease. And they used LSVT-BIG as um, the treatment intervention. And you can see that 
the black bars are pre-treatment and the gray bars are post-treatment. So they looked at both reaching tasks and different gait parameters and found that even though the focus was on amplitude, the speed or the velocity of reaching improved and also the velocity of the gait improved. And those were statistically significant improvements in uh, velocity of both. The first randomized control trial on LSVT BIG was published in 2010 in Movement Disorders. It's called the Berlin BIG study because they came out of Berlin, Germany. And it was one therapist that provided the intervention for both of the treatment intervention groups. So 60 patients were randomized into three groups. 20 did LSVT BIG. And as you remember, 16 sessions delivered four times a week for four weeks. 20 were randomized into a Nordic walking group where they also did 16 hours of sessions, but um, twice a week for eight weeks. And then 20 were in an unsupervised home exercise program group where they did um, exercises on their own that were very specific to Parkinson's disease, but um, without continued physical therapist supervision. So after um, they did the follow-up, I'll show you what happened here. The primary outcome variable was the UPDRS motor score. And if you know a little bit about this, this is a, uh, the UPDRS is a rating scale that most neurologists use that see people with Parkinson's disease. And a decrease in the UPDRS motor score signifies an improvement in motor functioning. It was a blinded rater. Um, LSVT big is the dashed line on the bottom and the home exercise program and Nordic walking groups are the lines um, above the, the dotted line and the solid line. So you can see that it was only the LSVT big group that made improvements um, at the end of treatment and continued to make improvements at the end point of the treatment study. The amount of improvements were st statistically and significantly um, significant and also the amount of change between the groups was also significant and it was about a five point drop on the UPDRS motor score which is on par with what researchers hope to um, find if they're doing a drug trial so I think really um, important and also elucidates the fact that hey exercise is medicine it has a very important and potent effect on motor function. The second randomized control trial was also published by Ebersbach in 2014. And a common question that many therapists have, if not all, is could we have achieved the same results of treatment with fewer visits? And so this research study looked to answer that question. They did LSVT big in two dosages. So one was the traditional dosage of 16 visits, four times a week for four weeks. And then the comparative treatment was a shortened training pro protocol where they did an intensive two weeks of therapy, five times a week for two weeks, so 10 total sessions. And they looked at a lot of different motor outcome scores, such as the 10 minute walk test, the six minute walk test, um, and, and some of the, the tug and the box and blocks as well. And what they found was that Actually, both groups did make changes in their motor function that were significant. However, the LSVT big traditional group outperformed, made greater changes than the shortened training protocol. But one of the most um, interesting findings, I believe, of this research study was really more about the patient's own perception of their change in function. So they use something called the Clinical Global Impression Scale or the CGI so they could rate, did you improve, um, Was are you worse, was there no change, or are you minimally improved, are you much improved, or are you very much improved? And if you look at the patients that were in the traditional LSVT big group, over 70% of them rated themselves as either much improved or very much improved. Whereas in the group that did the shortened protocol, only 17% rated themselves as much improved or very much improved. They had also a corresponding um, change that was very similar in the physicians that rated them on this. So that was a CGI for clinicians. And again, 68.8% of the physicians said that 
Um, the patients in the LSVT big traditional group were either much improved or very much improved, whereas only 28% said that the ones in the shortened training protocol were very much or much improved. So although they could perform well after um, two weeks on these common motor outcome studies and tests, the data suggests that they might not have been calibrated. Um, so one of the quotes from the author was, the reduced training intensity may not have been sufficient enough to maintain to obtain the main goal of LSVT BAG, and that is recalibrating movement amplitude to secure improved motor performance in routine activities without attentiveness towards movement execution. So in essence, they probably weren't calibrated. And without calibration, there's probably not going to be long-term carryover of those improvements. And because of that, the shortened training protocol is abandoned and not something that we um, offer to patients. Now, there's been many um, studies, preliminary studies, that have found improvements across the systems, motor systems, as a result of LSVT big. These are some of the findings that we have found in research studies, improved trunk rotation range of motion, stride length, um, speed of reaching, as we saw, speed of gait, reaction time, their motor score in the UPDRS scale, uh, balance coordination, ADLs, dual tasking is one of the more recent studies and one of the newest studies that was published looked at occupational performance improvements, which are um, really important to capture in our patients with PD. One of the other questions you might have is, is LSVT big used with other conditions beyond Parkinson's disease? And um, there is emerging research. It's very new research that has been published within the last three years. These are single subject case study and small group designs um, looking at application of LSVT big to individuals with chronic stroke. And there's one case study on an individual with idiopathic normal, hydro, um, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So those are exciting to see, and hopefully we'll continue to see more research coming in the, in the coming years. Clinically, we've been using LSVT big routinely for over 10 years on a variety of diagnoses with anecdotal improvements, um, especially in atypical Parkinsonisms, but also generalized balance dysfunction related to aging, MS, um, brain injury, other neurological disorders like stroke, et cetera. You can find all of our references on our blog. Here's the, the reference um, website here, blog.lsvtglobal.com, and then go to research. You can find the complete reference list, and then it's also parsed out into, for example, the pediatric references, technology references, LSVT big references, et cetera. So lastly, let's talk about some um, specific considerations for Parkinson's disease regarding both LSVT loud and LSVT big. Uh, one of the common questions that we have from therapists is, well, I can see how this could be beneficial for my patients with early to moderate stage Parkinson's, but what about those that have later stage Parkinson's that are very complex, maybe have other um, comorbidities that they're dealing with along with Parkinson's disease? When we do this, we don't reduce the training dosage. All of the components of the LSVT protocols are maintained. So we don't exclude any of the exercises. Um, we have the same daily exercises, the same functional phrases and component tasks we always have um, for that individual. We always do hierarchy exercises. We just might adapt them so that they are um, feasible for that patient to do and safe for that patient to do as well. So that could be different uh, position changes. Uh, they might need more repetition versus reading if they have visual or language impairments. Of course, they can do big walking with an assistive device. They can work on big posture, big steps when they're doing that. And as much as they need, we'll give them support and sometimes also train caregivers to help them um, as coaches at home. The focus still needs to be on hypokinesia, sensory awareness and individualized goals, regardless of the stage um, or situation of the person that we're treating. We say for all of our patients, you need a daily dose of your home exercise uh, practice, both during and after LSVT loud and LSVT big. And so the really the best combination for success is 
take your medicine on time every time to really optimize your symptom management for your Parkinson's disease and then do 15 to 20 minutes a day of practice of your LSVT loud exercises, your LSVT big exercises, and that really helps you to achieve the best results and maintain that over time. We also have worked hard on providing a number of tools to support patients after they go through LSVT loud and LSVT big. We know it's not easy for them. You know, they're dealing with depression and apathy, other challenges that make continued practice challenging sometime. So these are the, some of the things that we offer to patients. Um, they can um, obtain LSVT homework helper videos, they can download them, or there's DVD options where they can practice along with the videos in their home. One of our newer things that we offer is uh, Loud for Life and Big for Life. These are group exercise classes specifically for people that have gone through the treatment protocols. These can be offered in person in communities. So you could say, you know, everyone that's completed LSVT, you can come to my LSVT um, Loud for Life class or my Big for Life class. And we also offer them now virtually through Zoom through LSVT Global. And that's a, a very new thing. Then after we discharge the patient from that one month of therapy, we always make a plan for when we're going to see them again. Much like a dentist would say, I'll see you in six months for your next checkup. We say this to our patients as well. You're done for now, but you're gonna continue with your exercises every day. And I'm going to see you in six months again to see how you're doing, to reevaluate you. Maybe you give you a few sessions of therapy to tune you up and get you moving and speaking just as loud and big as you were before. And then additionally, we always encourage patients to engage in exercise in their community. There's many wonderful exercise classes. Um, it looks like throughout India as well in communities when um, they can get together with other people with Parkinson's and that's so vital for um, long-term health and wellness and symptom management in Parkinson's disease. One of the questions that a lot of patients ask is, well, I'm already doing so much exercise. I go to Tai Chi or I do, you know, walking or swimming or something like this. Can that regular intensive exercise replace me having to do these LSVT big and LSVT loud exercises every day? And we say to them, well, that's great that you're doing them, but really both are needed. Some of the reasons why are this. Um, not all exercise is focused on amplitude. You can bicycle, for example, but you might not be using large amplitude movements throughout your whole body. And with um, speech as well, you might be doing a singing class, but it's not really necessarily focused on amplitude. And we need our patients to keep this on the top of my minds. I have to think loud. I have to think big every day. Not all exercise classes are function focused as well. And if you think of, you know, dancing classes or in the United States, boxing has become very popular for people with Parkinson's disease. Again, they're wonderful, but they're not going to teach them. This is how I get in out of my car. This is how I get my my shirt on. This is how I can apply amplitude to cooking a meal. Um, and that's where we really come in as therapists is that individualized function focused training. And not all exercise that they're going to do is sensory focused as well. And we know that because of the sensory disorder, it's so important that we're um, really helping patients to recognize this is how it needs to feel to talk so that people can hear me. This is how it needs to feel so that I'm sitting and moving with normal movement. So some summary points, and then we'll leave some time for questions here. Um, LSVT loud and LSVT big address the core symptoms which all patients with PD experience. Small movements, softer voice, and that sensory motor mismatch. The intensive training and practice is supported by research on motor learning and neuroplasticity. It's a standardized protocol, but they can be individualized and adapted for each patient according to their needs and disease severity. There is robust data supporting improvements in speech, communication, motor functioning, and more. And we offer ongoing support for people 
um, after even they've gone through the LSVT protocols. And we also focus on training clinicians so you know how to properly execute and deliver these research-based treatment interventions for your patients. There's lots of ways that you can learn more um, on our blog and on our website. We have a wealth of information, more than you could even read in one day. We always have monthly webinars that are live and recorded that you can view. Um, those are found on our blog. Um, there's also different videos that you can find on our blog along with our research. We have social media. Um, so be sure to reach out and if there's specific questions that you have about the programs, email us. Um, we're really happy to engage with you and share information as well. If you're a therapist and you are interested at some point in the future getting certified in LSVT Loud or LSVT Big, there are two main ways that you can do that. One is through the online training and certification course. This is a pre-recorded course, um, LSVT Loud, of course, for speech therapists, and then it's a separate course, LSVT Big for physio and occupational therapists. Within the course, which takes around 12 hours, it's loaded with treatment videos. So you'll see tons of examples that will really bring this course to life. Um, there'll be time for you to practice all of the movements and exercises on your own and it's self-paced, meaning you can do it wherever you want as long as you have Wi-Fi. It is in English only and you have 60 days to complete the training once you register. The other option is virtual live LSVT Bay or LSVT Loud training and certification. And the training is really like you're experiencing right now with this introductory lecture. We do them via Zoom. And it's a mix of pre-recorded learning and then two days, um, usually five or six hour days of virtual live learning with LSVT Big and LSVT Loud faculty. What's fun about those courses, it includes practice with other um, fellow clinicians like yourself so that you can practice the exercises on each other virtually and even with some volunteers with Parkinson's disease. You can find all of them on our website. There's a large orange button at the top that says get LSVT certified and then you can choose either the online or the live course option. Um, the virtual live courses are listed under the live courses. So if you have patients that are interested in starting with LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, um, they can also find these clinicians on our website. And we have a small tribe of therapists in India who are currently LSVT Loud and LSVT Big certified. So they can type in their city and their country and find if anyone is certified in that area. Now, we have offered to you um, three different resources that have been translated into Hindi for people with Parkinson's. These aren't really specific about LSVT loud or LSVT big, but there's one on um, speech and swallowing, there's one on exercise, and there's one on tips for communication when you're wearing a mask. And I think Nicole is going to share those with you or share the link so that you can download those Feel free to print them off and hand them to your patients or send them via email. Um, we hope that those are useful resources for you. The two are two page documents and then the mask one I believe is a, a one page document. All right, so I think that brings us to the end of our slides, but not to the end of the webinar. We would like to use the remaining time if you choose to stay to address your questions live between Dr. Fox and myself. If you have to go and you think of questions later, you can always email us at info at lsvtglobal.com and our staff will make sure that either Dr. Fox or I get the questions and are able to follow up with you directly. So um, thank you all for joining us today and I'll um, turn it over to Cynthia and I, maybe yes. she's been monitoring the questions. Yep, I'm just going to start at the top and we'll click through them and if you can continue to type them in. So the first question and the first couple are speech probably because the speech was first. Um, so is their lower jaw shifting towards either side in Parkinson's? Um, not in general. And so it's not a common thing that we see, but 
for individuals who have a lot of dyskinesias, maybe some dystonia, you might see that, but it would be um, really on a case by case basis. Um, what about the application of LSVT post-traumatic brain injury? Um, the efficacy of intervention in chronic TBI where patients have learned inappropriate patterns over the years. Um, this will be a common answer for probably many disorders that are spinning through your head, both for loud and for big. What we always say is it might have good potential. And what we train in the course is how to take somebody who you're thinking about, do stimulability testing and assessment trial treatment, and then see how to proceed from there. So it definitely has uh, potential. Similarly, questions about LSVT, and I'm sure this is for loud and big with multi-system atrophy, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, so these atypical Parkinson's. Yes, in fact, rehab is about the only thing that helped these individuals because the medical and surgical treatments, not so much. So bring them in the earlier, the better, um, and they probably need more frequent follow-up. They also may need Need more support um, about from, from family, from caregivers, and things like that. And Laura, don't worry, you're going to get a bunch of questions here in a minute. I'm just going to click these off pretty fast. Um, why not group therapy? Why just individual therapy? Here's the key. Changing behavior that lasts in people with Parkinson disease is very challenging. We can do quick changes that you see, but do they walk out the door? So all of our research has been on individual therapy. The other thing is what's so important, both for movement and for speech, is we have to shape good quality. So if you have a group of five people going, ah, uh, I can't hear individual voice qualities and I need to do that. Otherwise somebody could potentially harm their voice. So that individual aspect is really important for that element as well as for personalizing materials and functional goals. And as Laura just presented, we do do groups after the individual therapy that can really help um, individuals maintain. Um, how effective is loud and severe therapy where there's rare vocalization or word usage? We say give everybody a chance. I would bring somebody in like that. I would work with them. I would see, can I get some vocalization that I could then shape into some oral communication, even if they still need to use some AAC, augmentative communication alongside. Okay, Laura, um, how can one register for the LSVT big course? I think you've nailed that, but if you just want to remind people quickly. Yeah, yeah, I think you probably typed that in before I said, but go to our website, lsvtglobal.com, find the big orange button in the corner that says get LSVT big or get certified, and then select your profession type, select which course you want, either online or live, and it'll lead you to the right path. So it's very easy to do. Perfect. Um, is LSVT effective in drug-induced Parkinson's? That would fall in that same category. There is definitely potential. Bring them in, stimulability, and we would see how it would progress, but there's no reason we would not think that it could work. Um, question about people who can't read. And Laura touched on that. I'll just reiterate, absolutely. What we would do is translate any reading material to more conversational. If they can see but not read, we may use pictures and picture description, repetition, and we'll just increase the complexity of speech as we go on, but in a format different from reading. Um, let's see. Uh, let's get some. Okay, Laura, can you please elaborate on using LSVT big functionality in bedridden patients having difficulty to turn and sit up on the bed? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. And uh, actually, you can help your patients a lot that are bedridden. All of the LSVT big exercises, first of all, can be adapted to a supine position. And during the training course, we would teach you how that works. Uh, and then a lot of the functional activities that a person might need to do in bed, like a covering and uncovering themselves, turning over, 
reaching for the clock, um, repositioning in bed, getting in and out of bed, those could all be the functional things that you work on uh, driving amplitude so they can do them more independently, more safely. And wouldn't it be great if you could really progress that patient to the point where they weren't bedridden anymore, where you could you know, improve their motor function so much that they could begin to get out of bed, transfer to a chair, you know, spend more time out, out and about, which is very, of course, good for them. Perfect. And to follow up, we've got more big questions. Can LSVT be big be delivered online? And again, this is oh. keeping in mind COVID, geographical yeah. variables, things like that. Yes, great question. Again, uh, we are in the process of learning so much about that. Prior to COVID, we really had no experience in delivering LSVT big via telehealth. But over the last year, there have been a number of clinicians who have begun to do that. And we've been trying to give them guidance about how that would work. But definitely, um, maybe not for every individual, but for individuals who are safe without direct supervision in their mobility, um, that are cognitively able to handle technology, it, it definitely could be. And after you're certified, there are some webinars and some other tools that you can utilize um, from LSVT Global to learn more about that. Perfect. And LSVT Loud, 100% online. In fact, if we've got research data. It's as comparable. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Okay, Laura, this is a nice one. The exercise of large amplitudes has a risk of imbalance or fall in patients who experience dyskinesia and on phase of medication. So the question is, is LSVT done specifically on or off phase medication? Mm, that's a really interesting question. And I would say there's not a, a clear answer that fits for every patient that has dyskinesias. Um, some patients, if their dyskinesias are mild, they do better when you're doing LSVT big during the medication on state. Others, you might have to um, plan your treatment for when they're actually during in the medication off state so that you can move more safely. And always, I would say it's a conversation with a neurologist as well, because as a therapist, we spend so much time, 16 hours with our patients. Sometimes we can give valuable information as to the severity of the dyskinesia. Um, that's helpful for the neurologist in case they decide they need to make any medication adjustments. Wonderful. Um, a question about making certification courses available for people in India. And Laura talked about the online course, which of course is English, but is available at any time. And I think as we move forward, we also might think about collaborations now that we've established this to get a course, perhaps virtual live, um, that is tailored for people in India perfect in your time zone and things like that. So stay tuned, but we're motivated to make this more accessible. Um, the protocols, can we use for child conditions also? And the answer is yes, we're learning more. For LSVT Loud, we have a bit more advanced knowledge. We have um, four, three different four different cohorts of children, three with cerebral palsy, one with Down syndrome we've treated, um, even through neural imaging in those individuals. And we would take them on a case-by-case -case basis again. We do have some LSVT big therapists who are now using it in pediatric populations and seeing nice changes. So it's something we would talk about in the, the two-day course and also talk about how to... Um, figure out if it's a good fit or not. Can you talk about calibration again? How do we get them to calibrate? Is it like feedback? And Laura, if you wanna take a first pass at that. Yeah, um, calibration is something that we begin to train from the very first day of, of treatment. And uh, during the certification courses, we talk a, a lot more about that, but it's a, it's a process that's woven in through each and every LSVT big session, starting with getting them to recognize that my voice is too soft or my movements are too small. Um, and then really 
driving their amplitude, getting them more comfortable with that in therapy, and then also out in public through carryover assignments, giving them frequent feedback of, yes, that was big enough, or yes, that was loud enough, that was normal amplitude, over and over and over again, so that over the course of 16 sessions, they begin to internalize this to the point where they don't require our feedback anymore because they've learned this new internal cue over treatment. So that's a very simple answer. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Cynthia. I think that's good. It is uh, it is a huge process and a part of the treatment. And again, we spend a couple hours on it in the training course, uh, learning more about it. But you know, to recognize, I think at, at this level, um, making changes that last are a challenge and the sensory problem is a big piece of that. Um, is caregiver training or counseling included? And Laura, I'll let you take that mm -hmm. one as well. Sure. A lot of times um, it's necessary to do some caregiver training. We start simply by inviting that caregiver to participate in the LSVT treatment sessions to begin by observing what we do as therapists, how we cue the patient, how we model the exercises, how we drive amplitude, and then um, teaching them how to do the exercises themselves if they need to do that in order to be a coach at home. And sometimes as simple as um, teaching them, hey, these are the cues that are really helpful so that you don't have to lift the patient out of the chair. The patient can get out of the chair independently if you cue them in, in the correct way. Um, in one of the LSVT big homework helper DVDs, we also include a video for caregivers that they can watch that chapter and learn more about that. Excellent. Um, what are the effects of LSVT on non-motor symptoms? I love that question because we talked about non-motor symptoms. And so we have not systematically, <clears throat> excuse me, studied where we, uh, pre and, and prospectively measured non-motor symptoms before therapy and after therapy. We do have some indirect data. We have some, there's been a one study, actually there was one study that looked at the geriatric depression scale mm -hmm. and showed improvements right. after LSVT big. In some of our LSVT loud studies, we have looked at things, um, quality of life, sickness impact profile, and there was reduction on the perception of Parkinson's on communication disorders. Um, so it's, it's something we would love to study more systematically. What we see clinically is that the motivation can kick in. Um, it can help with uh, overriding some apathy. Um, in some patients, they self-report reduced anxiety because they feel like they have a technique or a tool to either manage communication or movement. And even if they encounter problems, they're more confident um, about dealing with that. So there's a lot to learn um, and we're excited to perhaps dig into that more in the future. Let's take maybe two more questions and then I'm going to turn it back over to our hosts. Um, Laura, are there any strategies for dual tasking and LSVT, for example, walking and talking? Mm -hmm. Right, a really important um, thing that we work on with LSVT Big. Step one is we work on helping the patient to learn how to rescale their amplitude so that they're walking with normal stride length, normal arm swing. Once they're fairly competent at that, we start to introduce dual task challenges, but we teach them how to prioritize amplitude rather than the cognitive or motor dual task. So we as a therapist in the background are always monitoring amplitude and saying, keep it big, you know, keep your arm swing big, keep your steps big as we're doing that dual task, whether it's texting on their phone or talking or doing um, cognitive challenges, whatever it may be. Perfect. Um, here's a question. What about Parkinson cases having dysphagia? So swallowing problems. Will LSVT be incorporated within dysphagia exercises? So at this time, we have looked, there are two published studies that have actually looked at changes in swallowing post LSVT lab. They're small studies. Um, there was some evidence of some improvements in the oral phase of swallowing. A second study out of Australia showed some improvement in things like protective cough, um, which we know can be important for swallowing. 
But at this time, LSVT loud is not swallowing therapy. So if they're swallowing concerns, we always recommend addressing those directly and with direct swallowing techniques first. That said, some individuals who go through LSVT loud absolutely do report afterwards um, perceived improvements in swallowing, be it control of saliva. Um, <clears throat> and we do a lot of swallowing in LSVT lab because we have them drink a lot of water. So it's interesting. And I think we'll learn more about that as well in the future. But at this time, they're separate treatments, but may have complementary overlap. Okay, we're right at the end of our time. So I, I know there's more questions that did not get answered. Um, if we can answer them after the fact, perhaps with the record of the chat, um, we're happy to do that. But I, I'd like to turn it back over to our hosts uh, to make any concluding remarks. Me? Thank you so much, Cynthia. <laughs> That was really rapid fire question and answer <laughs> round. Uh, thank you so much for answering so many questions. Uh, Dr. Barreto, are you here? I think we just have to unmute you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we've come to the end of a really good session. I, we've learned a lot and everyone's learned a lot about LSVT. We've heard about it, but Listening to you, I think, has broadened our horizons in terms of how it could work with people with Parkinson's. And I'm sure the allied health professionals here would want to know more and possibly we can figure out how we work together to get your program to people in India. So thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Laura. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's happened. So. Yes. Thank you it's so the much. Start. We see this just as a start yes. and um, we love your enthusiasm. We love the questions. And so we definitely will work together and we will make this partnership happen and flourish. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all for, for the opportunity to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, we really, really enjoyed the session. And I also learned a lot uh, from the session. So thank you very, very much. Uh, for the audience, uh, we have put the link. It's a Google Drive link. So if you would like the handouts, which Laura mentioned, uh, the posters for uh, people in Hindi and in English, you'll find it in the Google Drive link, which we'll reshare again in the chat box. Uh, we also have um, another interesting webinar, which is coming up next week. Uh, please, could you share that slide? The last slide, please. So yes, after this great webinar, we have another great personality uh, from Parkinson's, um, so David Leventhal, who's going to be doing a session on managing pa Parkinson's through artful movements. And that's all happening on April 24th, which is next Saturday. Uh, so please do, if you're interested, do contact us. We'll be sending out the posters on social media with the registration link soon. And next slide, please. And if you do know anyone with Parkinson's anywhere in India, please do let them uh, know about our organization and the work that we do. All our services are free of cost. Uh, so we have uh, contact numbers, email. We have lots of educational videos on uh, our YouTube page. We have a Facebook page as well and our website and Instagram. So uh, please do help us raise awareness about Parkinson's uh, in India and so that we can help people and give them as much support as we can. But once again, thank you very much, Cynthia and Laura, for this great session. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining. Do have a great weekend. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.